Good morning. I'm Dr. George Cressman, and I'd like to welcome you to the Camp Landing Museum. Camp Landing trained over 800,000 men during World War II, and just over 150 different units trained here. We'll start with talking a little bit about General Albert Blanding, our namesake. So General Blanding was born in Iowa, but he quickly moved when he was two years old. His family moved to, uh, to Florida, and General Blanding grew up in Florida, joined the National Guard, served with uh, the 2nd Florida Infantry on the Mexican-U.S. border during the punitive expedition, and then uh, General Blanding served in the 27th Infantry Division, commanded the 53rd Infantry Brigade during World War I. And during the interwar period, he commanded the 31st Infantry Division. And then he rose to command all of the National Guard's uh, units here in the United States. So one of our prized displays here is a set of General Blanding's uh, personal belongings. You see his command flag there, his command sword. The 1911 pistol in that was General Blanding's personal sidearm. Camp Landing was established initially in 1939 as the primary training site for the Florida National Guard. And in the summer of 1940, it was mobilized for federal service for what eventually became World War II. And in the space of roughly 90 days, over 10,000 buildings were built on Camp Landing. So in this display, you see a series of photographs of the construction activities. So massive construction project, the peak construction employment employment was 22,000. They worked three shifts a day, seven days a week. It was a tremendous employment draw right at the end of the Great Depression in the United States. As the construction was finished, infantry units began to come in to Camp Landing to train. And here you see a mannequin with the uniform of the day. This is late 1940, early 1941, before Pearl Harbor. And notice the Doughboy helmet, the Spring, uh, Springfield 1903 rifle. This is before the M1 Garand was introduced. But notice the soldier's boots and his leggings, standard army uniform for late 1940, early 1941. Soldiers who came here were responsible for caring for their equipment and their clothing. So all soldiers had a set of personal gear, a set of personal equipment that they, uh, that they, that they use routinely. And you notice here, there's a little interesting device right in here, this silver device. That's a razor blade sharpener. Over here, we see what was called a housewife. So they all had a sewing kit that they called a housewife. There were also items in the PXs that, that uh, soldiers could buy for their families. And as you notice up on the wall in this display, there is a uh, shirt for a youngster. So my dad is in the U.S. Army very common display uh, item, uh, a very common PX item uh, for soldiers to buy if they had a young uh, child at home. Now in addition to the training that happened here, there were two prisoner of war camps here. There was a German Navy camp that had somewhere between 100 and 150 men in it. And then there was a German Army camp that was here and they had anywhere from 1,000 to 1,200 prisoners in the German uh, army camp. This is a diorama of the German army prisoner of war compound here. In addition to the compound that was here at Camp Landing, Camp Landing administered 22 subposts all across the state of Florida. And at the end of the war, there were upwards of 10,000 German prisoners of war 
here at Camp Landon. Now I mentioned earlier that there were uh, just over 150 units that trained here at Camp Landon. Of those 150 units, nine of them were infantry divisions. So in this portion of the museum, we have a display for each of the nine infantry divisions that trained here. Of those nine divisions, seven of them went to either the Mediterranean or European theater of operations. Two of them went to the Pacific theater. Of our nine infantry divisions, three of them were spearhead units or first assault units in an amphibious invasion. So the 1st and 29th Infantry Divisions were spearhead units in the Normandy invasion, and the 36th Infantry Division was, this, was a spearhead unit in Operation Dragoon, the 15 August 1944 invasion of southern France. This display will give you some sense of, of the major uh, mode of transportation to the war theaters. Most soldiers went to the war theaters by ship. And of all the soldiers that went to the European and Mediterranean theaters, some 45% of them went either on the Queen Mary or the Queen Elizabeth. Now we think of these as, as uh, luxury cruise liners but if you look at this photograph of the men on the Queen Elizabeth, you get some sense for how many men were crammed into that, uh, that ship. It was far from a luxury liner. Accommodations look something like this. So there's how men were billeted on the, uh, on the transport ships. In the U.S., most transportation was by rail. So there were typical Pullman cars. Some of them were sleepers, but the majority of them were standard passenger cars. Men traveled for days on end, sitting in seats. Equipment also had to move. So here you see how equipment was carried across uh, the United States ranging all the way from the tanks that you see there through ducks, D-U-K-W's, trucks, jeeps, everything moved by rail. This is one of my favorite displays in the museum. This is devoted to the Army medics, uh, Army Corps medics. I believe they're the unsung heroes of all Army interactions. So a couple of interesting points, you see the standard uh, uh, helmet that, that uh, medics in the European and Mediterranean theater war with the Red Cross emblem on the helmet, Red Cross bizarre on the, on the arm. The reason why I point out that this uh, is a European theater uh, display is because of that Red Cross emblem on a helmet. Germany and Italy were both signatories of the Geneva Convention on Land Warfare, which meant that they recognized uh, medics as non-combatants. This is not the case in the Pacific Theater. The Japanese were not signatories to the uh, Geneva Convention, uh, and therefore uh, did not recognize the non-combatant nature of, of medics. So in the European theater, you rarely saw a medic with a Red Cross emblem, emblem on their helmet or wearing the, the Red Cross on their sleeve. You saw them typically with unmarked helmets. And in the European theater, uh, medics did not, carry, uh, did not carry weapons. But in the Pacific theater, almost always, uh, the medics carried a weapon of some kind to protect them. Themselves. This is a display of the common weapons used by infantry during the war. On this side we have U.S. weapons, Allied weapons, and on the other side we have German weapons. Now earlier 
I commented on the 1903 Springfield rifle that that 43rd Infantry Division soldier had. This is the weapon that replaced that Springfield 1903, the M1 Grand uh, rifle. It was the main battle rifle of the U.S. troops during World War II, both for Army and later for the Marine Corps. Some other interesting weapons in this display case on the Allied side. On the top, we have the grease gun. And this was an, a, a, a submachine gun, and it would re replace the Thompson submachine gun. So the next row down is the Thompson submachine gun itself. Right. Both of those fire a 45 caliber, same as the, the standard 1911 uh, pistol. On the bottom, uh, next row be below the Garand, we have the Browning automatic rifle, the BAR. This weapon actually came, uh, was first used in World War I. It could be fired either on full auto or on single shot. On the other side, we have, uh, we have uh, the German, the Axis uh, weapons. The top piece is the K98 Mauser, and it's a, a bolt action rifle. As we come down, the third, uh, third one down here is the first of the true assault rifles. This is Sturmgewehr, and it's uh, uh, an invention of the, of the Germans. It's, it's a nice, uh, interesting piece. It shoots a round, a bullet that's halfway between a pistol round and a rifle round. And then just below that is the MP40. Of the 150 units that trained here, one of them was the 508th Parachute Infantry Regiment. But I wanted to just highlight this photograph of a, uh, a young uh, paratrooper here. And his name is Bill Trent, William Trent. Bill was for a long time one of our museum docents here. Uh, unfortunately, we've lost him, but that's Bill Trett, uh, just as he was leaving the Normandy area after the invasion of Normandy. Mr. Trett jumped in Normandy, but he also jumped in Market Garden, the, uh, the thrust up through uh, the Netherlands. And this is Mr. Tripp's, uh, Trett's decorations. And if you notice his paratrooper wings here, He's got two spearheads on there, bronze points. Those were his two combat jumps, one for Normandy and one for Market Garden. And this, of course, is what the paratroopers look like when they jumped out of that C-47 in, in Normandy or Market Garden. Notice a pair, uh, the, the reserve chute in front and a full, uh, full back uh, shoot on his back and his rifle which is the M1 uh, carbine with the folding stock. In this section of the museum we pay tribute to the many many women who supported both as as members of the army and as civilians in war goods industries. We'll think first about uh, the civilians and you notice the standard poster here of Rosie, uh, Rosie the Riveter, um, we can do it. This sense of, of women who participated fully in the, the war production good, because so many men were serving, upwards of 12 million men serving in the uh, military forces, armed forces of the United States. Women had to step up. And so many, many war goods industry uh, firms could po not possibly have operated without the work of women in, in, uh, in their service. Now, there were also women who were in, uh, in the Army itself. We'll highlight first the Army Nurse Corps. The Army Nurse Corps provided a critical service for, uh, for the Army in the Medical Corps. We had a number of, of Army Nurse Corps women, upwards of, of 250 that served here at Camp Landing during the war. 
There was also the Women's Army Corps. So there was an issue initially about how women could come into the army itself and be protected under the Geneva Conventions on Warfare. And that required that they become active members of the army. So a number of, of jobs that men traditionally did in the army began to be taken over by uh, women in the Women's Army Corps. Throughout the war, we had an active detachment of Women's Army Corps here at Camp Landing. This display will give you a standard view of what a German Army um, enlisted man looked like during the war. So in this display, you see him carrying his uh, K-98 Mauser. You see the standard stick grenade as well as the field gray uniform and the helmet of a German army enlisted man. There are also some German weapons on display here. One of the more interesting ones, I believe, is the, um, is the German uh, heavy machine gun. So these machine guns were probably the best of the machine guns that were um, that were used during the war. This machine gun has a very characteristic sound of a ripping cloth when it's fired. And the Allied soldiers learned to hate that sound as it, uh, as it was, uh, the weapon was being fired. So there's a brief introduction to what you can see when you visit Camp Landing. Please know we're open every day, seven days a week from noon to four. We'd most welcome your visit. Admission is free. So this is Dr. George Kratzman. I'm signing off. Hope to see you soon at the Camp Landing Museum.